This episode is brought to you by Ursa Minor Outfitters. Folks, I'm absolutely in love with my Loon mug. It's handmade. It's an absolute piece of art. Whether it's at the office or at the house, people keep asking to check it out. If you're not a Loon fan, they also have other beautiful mugs for wildlife fans of moose, bears, and eagles. They specialize in products highlighting the outdoors and local pride through quality design by local artists. They've even started expanding into items beyond mugs, like apparel, dog accessories, and soon candles and more. They also try to partner and highlight other small businesses, and in some cases, forgo profits in lieu of charitable giving to help their community, such as the dog rescue. So check them out, ursaminoroutfitters.com, and enter promo code HIKESMIKES10 at checkout to receive 10% off your order. And for our four-legged hiking partners, they also have a portable silicone dog bowl and also a sweet over-the-collar dog bandana. Go check them out, ursaminoroutfitters.com, and don't forget to enter promo code HIKESMIKES10 at checkout to receive 10% off your order. Welcome everyone to the Hikes and Mikes podcast. I'm your host, Ivan, and together we'll embark on a weekly journey connecting with extraordinary hikers from all corners of the U.S. and beyond. Throughout these winter months, we've had the privilege of conversing with some remarkable individuals this season. Their experiences and adventures will leave you yearning to hit the trails. In this week's episode, we're talking with an amazing hiker who's currently based out of Tennessee, but spent some time out here in eastern Washington, which served as his launch pad into Idaho and Montana. His name is Monty, and you can follow him on Instagram at Monty underscore Score Junior 5. Monty shares with us some of his favorite outdoor and hiking destinations in and around Tennessee and what it was like exploring the Colville National Forest in eastern Washington. He also shares with us some of his favorite places in the beautiful state of Montana. Without further ado, let's jump into this episode with our guest, Monty. Welcome, everyone, to the latest episode of the Hikes and Mikes podcast. I'm really excited to speak with this upcoming guest. He has spent some time in the Pacific Northwest, and right now he's based out of Tennessee, which is a place that I've really been intrigued in learning more about the landscape and and what it has to offer for outdoor experiences. But Monty, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. You know, we always like to start off by asking our guests, how long they've been hiking for, and how they got started. Yeah, hey, first off, I'm, I'm really grateful for the uh, chance to come on here and, uh, you know, just talk about the great outdoors. You know, I think it's something that bonds a lot of us, and that's really special. So I, I didn't want to be remiss and not say thank you for this opportunity. But, you know, I'd say it's kind of a way of life. My family's pretty big into the outdoors. My father was, he liked fishing, and so I kind of started doing that at a young age. And we went picnic every summer, 4th of July, up in the Tennessee the rivers and things up there close to the Smoky Mountain National Park, you know, and I don't know, it's just, it's just kind of more and more as I've gotten older, you know, kind of like a lot of things, you appreciate things a little bit more as you get older. Kind of wish I had taken more chances when I was younger to explore, but I've made up for it in my 20s and early 30s for sure. So really just, you know, I think it started at a young age and I slowly got into it. I actually took a youth trip to Montana when I was probably about 15. Going from Tennessee to Montana, it's like, whoa. You know, that's Tennessee is beautiful, but Montana is like a majestic. So I've been hooked ever since then, to be honest with you. Yeah. And it seems like Montana is definitely one of your favorite places to visit because you you tend to go back frequently and explore more and more of it, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, Montana is, it'll always be special because it was the first, you know, I guess state out West that I explored truly. So there's some sentimental value in there too. And it's just, it's kind of like a laid back feel, but it's at the same time, there's just a lot of energy in that state for me. If that makes sense. Yeah, I've just got a special connection with it for sure. It has so much to offer. You know, one thing I'm interested in, Monty, is I haven't had a chance to really explore the Southeast a lot. And the more I speak to people from the Southeast, the more I learn that it's a it's a hidden gem for outdoor experiences especially like waterfalls and hiking. How would you describe the outdoor scene and hiking scene in and around your neck of the woods? Yeah, you know, I think you, you're you right there. You know, I just went on about Montana, but, you know, I don't want to undersell what, what's in the southeast. The thing about here is that it's pretty compact. So you're really never more than half a day drive to somewhere else, you know, no matter where you live. That's one of the disadvantages about West is sometime, I mean, you got to drive seven hours to get somewhere you're trying to go here. I mean, you're two, three hours and you got somewhere brand new that's beautiful yet seen. 
specifically, I'm kind of on the western side of Tennessee right now. Arkansas is a very underrated state. The Ozark Mountains are beautiful. I actually went on a, a hike with my fiance, and that's where I proposed to her. I took her back there a couple of years later. So that was, if that tells you how much I enjoy the outdoors and hiking, I don't know what would. So I figured if she said no, I still have a good time hiking, you know, but <laughs> <I'm> just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. But, but no, you also, know, so that's, that's a special place. And Tennessee, obviously, I think everybody knows about the, the Smoky Mountains. You know, it's, they're beautiful. I'd recommend anybody to go, try to go early morning. You know, you know the routine. If you're listening to this, you're a pretty advanced hiker. You know, you want to avoid the crowds, but it's, there's a lot of hidden gems there as well. Once you get out of the Gatlinburg touristy area, I've really enjoyed my hikes there because the hikes aren't near as crowded and there's some big mountains i remember the first time i hiked there i, I was kind of blown away with how big they were you know because you kind of think of hills more so than like big peaks and glacier peaks you know it was really it was really peaceful I, I enjoyed it and fall creek falls cummings falls all those in kind of the mid-state of tennessee those are breathtaking waterfalls absolutely beautiful and they're pretty easy to access you, you drive down the road pull off hike for about 20 minutes and boom you're there so, and those are always fun. I mean, who doesn't like a beautiful waterfall? You go down to Northern Alabama, I know that's not thought of as highly, but I'm telling you, there's some beautiful waterfalls there. And the unique thing about Alabama, I give it credit, is I don't know if they're doing it intentionally, but they do not publicize a lot of their pretty parks and stuff like that. <laughs> so if you ask some locals, you'll find some really good waterfalls that are kind of hidden not much of a trail on some of them, but when you get there, it's breathtaking. Shangri-La Falls is one of them. It's just a little tip there for people. It's uh, in Will William Bankhead National Forest. I'll give them a little plug here. They probably okay. don't want it, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, you kind of touched base on it, Monty. Like One thing that I really like about the East Coast is the accessibility to multiple destinations. Because mm -hmm. like you're saying, here in Washington, for me, it would take about like six hours to get to Idaho, even more so to go to Montana. But from the, the Southeast, especially like like you're saying, two to three hours in any direction, and you're in a different state with a different feel. But there in Tennessee, and, and I'm learning this also about the, the Southeast, is like you're saying, a lot of the, the gorgeous hikes don't require like a five, six mile hike in. A lot of them are pretty accessible. Is that what you've been able to find there in Tennessee, that you don't have to go super long distances to reach beautiful landscapes? Yeah. Absolutely. I will say there is something to grinding through a 12 mile hike. And I think we've all been there. And then it's like a grit, you know, halfway through, you're like, man, what am I doing? You know, and then the reward pays off. And it's like you feel, you know, gratitude or, you know, you feel like you've earned it. You, you don't lose much of that. Some of the hikes here are brief, but usually they're kind of steep or slippery on some rocks, you know, the waterfalls. But yeah, I mean, that is an advantage. One thing I like to do is hit maybe two or three a day, you know, because usually one destination is all you can knock out some places. But here you can check out a waterfall in the morning, have some breakfast, go check out another one. And then, you know, I get catch a sunset somewhere else, like a big mountain, you know. So it, it's really, it's a wonderful, wonderful chance to see multiple things in one day because a lot of us are limited with time. You know, we can't just take weeks off to explore. So it is, that is an advantage uh, for sure. And and they're they're beautiful and gives you more time to be there and enjoy it as well. And some of the waterfalls that you've been able to post on your feed, it, it doesn't even seem like it's in the United States. It seems like somewhere tropical, yeah. just how green things in, are yeah. and just the cascading falls that you guys tend to have over there with the yeah. plunging pool. Are there yeah. any favorite swimming holes that you have that have a waterfall feature in them? Fall Creek Falls and Tennessee is a good one. And uh, Cummings Falls is a good one in Tennessee as well. And there's always some hidden ones throughout the state to where you can jump in and go in. Shangri-La, the one I mentioned earlier, is a beautiful one. That's kind of what you're talking about, that clear crystal water, green. Like, it, you're right. I was, if you showed me a picture of that, Alabama would have been the 50th state, I guess. You know, it's beautiful. I would say that those those three are my favorite ones to, to dip into, for sure. Well, you know, we're, we're recording this at the tail end of fall. And mm -hmm. I think Tennessee, and specifically in and around Tennessee, you guys do have a really great fall color season there. Mm -hmm. How was your fall season and did you get a chance to do any memorable hikes? Uh, yeah, so I got to do a few. I just welcomed the new uh, baby girl into the world, so I've been kind of keeping it close to home lately. Her middle name is actually named after a lake in Montana, so that shows my devotion, right? Speaking of that, but no, I have enjoyed the fall. I went to the Smoky Mountains and it's beautiful up there this time of year. You know, the, the changing of the leaves, the fog, like, it's, it's truly truly amazing and it's pictures don't do it justice i will say that you, you gotta be there but i was wasn't that crowded i went super early and just kind of took my time going up and i really just 
breathe in some cool air and I love to recommend that to anybody. You know, that's something that I'm, I'm starting to realize because I think a lot of us have the Northeast as a bucket list for fall mm-hmm. colors, but we're seeing the huge crowds, especially on the weekend and, you know, bumper to bumper traffic, but mm. especially the Smoky Mountain region, you get the beautiful fall colors, but you don't have to deal with the, the super large crowds. Is that an accurate testament? Yes and no. I would say you got to pick your battles. Just to be to be honest, sometimes it's not crowded at all. If you get there early, just think the reverse of a tourist and you'll kill it. You know, you'll just go, okay. go an hour or two before anybody else is going to be awesome. But okay. it actually, I think I did see a stat. I think it is the most visited national park in the country. So, and now again, we keep hitting on this. I think it's because it's regionally accessible to so many people, so many states. It doesn't take much for someone in, you know, Atlanta. To say, hey, let's go scope the Gatlinburg for the weekend, you know, or come down from, you know, North Carolina or something, you know, or actually it's kind of in North Carolina, yeah. but you know, get what I'm saying. But now, you know, this episode is going to be coming out in the middle of winter and you've experienced the winters here in the Pacific Northwest. How is the winters in Tennessee and do you still get a chance to explore um, the outdoors in the winter months? Yeah. They're usually, they're not near as snow heavy. I kind of miss that. Actually, that's one of the things I loved out there, the snow. But in the way that it's more sunny here, more often, just a little bit. That that's a stereotype that's not entirely accurate about up there, you know, in some parts. It's sunny, it snows. We typically about January and February is when we get most of our snow. And it's probably only a couple weeks at a time. But I love the woods when it snows. So I I'll go shoot over to Arkansas, do one of those hikes. Waterfalls, you know, it's kinda not their peak time, you know, in the winter. That's I kind of stick to more mountains and, and hills and scenery during the winter. And right now, spring probably seems like the furthest thing away possible. But you know that here in the Pacific Northwest, the spring wildflowers are a big thing and it attracts people out on the trails. What's the spring hiking season there in Tennessee? Green, really green. And it seems like it happens in two days. Because, you know, here, the, the type of trees we have, a lot of them lose everything. You know, it kind of looks almost gloomy sometimes. But that's kind of pretty in itself. But as soon as it comes back, and just green everywhere. If you got allergies, get some Benadryl. You know, it's probably going to be sneezing, some eyes burning, but but just being honest, but it's worth it. It's it's beautiful. It, it seems like really on the eastern side of the state, it gets green fast. It's not that dry, you know, so it, it's tons of green. Tennessee, Kentucky, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Arkansas, you know, it's all it's all green and really really pretty and it gets gets warm fast seems like yeah do you guys have to deal with uh, mosquitoes early on in the spring months yeah pretty early it seems like they get worse obviously as as the summer creeps in the weather is pretty it's getting to where it's kind of unpredictable day to day one day it's you know 55 next day high 31 and then it shoots up to 60 so kind of up and down there for the months of uh, april you know april and may but yeah mosquitoes are are something you got to deal with especially in the delta areas you kind of honestly get used to them after a little bit but yes that would be something you got to deal with now monty uh, you've spent some time here in washington and not just on the western side of the state but also on the eastern side of the state and you've got a chance to visit all over Washington and, and explore the national parks, state parks, and, and national forests. What was your outdoor experiences like in Washington? And what are some of your favorite spots that you got a chance to visit while here in the Evergreen State? Man, I'll tell you what, I absolutely love that state. And what's funny about that is I moved there, I took a job. Of course, I was looking at going to Montana. My company had two locations, and the one in Washington is the one that hired me on. Uh, just outside of Spokane, actually, is where I started. So I'll tell you what, man. I love that state because it's got everything. I think it's got all the terrains possible. You know, you have you have the desert, you have the rainforest, you have the mountains, you got the beach. It's an absolute wonderful state. And my family probably get tired of me talking about it all the time, but I absolutely love Washington. It is very dear to my heart because I moved out there kind of early, mid-20s. You know, I was single at the time, just living life. You know, I've always said, you know, explore and grow. You know, I think it's very important for us to continue to grow. And that was probably the most I've ever grown as a person, too is that time. Obviously, it's, I think it's incredible. And especially the hidden spots, you know, everybody knows the Seattle area is beautiful. Like, you know, Rattlesnake Ledge is nice. Diablo Lake is breathtaking. I love those those hikes and the Olympic National Park. Yeah, I mean, it's one of my favorites was probably Goat Lake. So I kind of got into, I would basically work during the week, maybe take some weeks off. And I was hiking 
all, all the time, nonstop, especially during that spring and summer for a couple of years. And, and I pretty much hit all the state. But yeah, Seattle is breathtaking. I really like Arlington, Washington, right above it. A little bit less of a crowd. Goat Lake was breathtaking. It was beautiful. It was I'm pretty intent hiker sometimes, especially when I'm alone. I will, if I'm excited, I will freaking haul. So I'm in pretty good shape. And I got up there quick and got to spend the whole day. So I really loved it there. It's breathtaking and just the pine trees, the animals and everything. And then obviously, let's talk about the eastern side. I think it's underrated. You know, I think yeah. everybody talks about Seattle, rightfully so. Absolutely beautiful and the beach over there and everything. The east side's beautiful. Spokane, I know, has kind of a reputation. I understand. I'm aware. But even that city's got some nice places. Like Bowl and Pitcher is like a little spot you can go. And it's a beautiful river that kind of runs all along miles and miles. It's just wonderful. You'll see tons of wildlife there. Colville is an amazing place. That's one of the first places I went to explore. Um, oh, really? I just, yes. I drove my Jeep up there and just told myself, hey, no agenda. We're just going to drive and explore. I stumbled upon, I cannot remember the name of the, the hike, but it was breathtaking. Up just the most majestic, beautiful day ever. And that is an uncharted area for a lot of people. And it's it's breathtaking. It's, you know, give me seclusion, calmness. And that beats everything. And, you know, saw wolf yeah. tracks too. Stuff like that. I love that. I, I know a lot yeah. of people get scared, scared of wildlife. Don't get me wrong. I, I had kind of a thing with a mountain lion one time. Got a little edgy, mm -hmm. kind of nervous. That scares me. Yeah, but I love it. I think the more out in the woods you are, kind of a little bit more risk, the more I like it. But Colville is wonderful. Uh, and then one little place right on the border of Idaho is uh, Liberty Lake. I really love that place. Uh, when I first moved there, I kind of live around Spokane before I moved to the other side. But Liberty Lake was a place I'd go you know, maybe just sit still for an hour or two. Had some deer come up close to me one time, saw a big moose one time. And yeah, it's pretty wild. You know, that's that's kind of in the city, really. It's kind, it's not, but it's really not that far from, from Spokane Valley, you know. And Liberty Lake is it's nice. It's secluded. I did a winter hike there. I had a friend take me there. I, I just moved and uh, they said, you're going to like this. Uh, I'll, I'll show it to you. And it just snowed and it was, it was amazing. So Liberty Lake is no, I know I kind of rambled there. But I really want to give Eastern Washington its due. It's, and then I, I spent some time down towards Washington state, you know, down there. I, my job, I traveled a little bit. My job required me to travel. So that was kind of a plus. I got to see a lot. Yeah. No, I, I'm glad you gave Eastern Washington a little bit of sh of a shout out because, yeah. you know, rightfully so, the, the national parks and the Cascades are worth the visit. And yeah. I've only made it up to the Colville National Forest a handful of times. And each time it's just, it's it's breathtaking because it's, it's so different from the Cascade Range. And you've touched base on it. There's only, you know, certain wildlife, they're only in that region of Washington. Like the Northern Cascades might have a grizzly bear or two, maybe a moose, but that northeast corner of Washington, you know, they have a little bit of a grizzly population. They have the moose that come down from Canada. You know, the wolves, just a little bit different landscape. I would say maybe it's a little drier compared to the Cascades, but just the rolling hills and mountains there are just impressive. You know, you, you kind of touch base on it. Spokane is, is kind of out there. It's the biggest city in eastern Washington, but it also gives you a shorter trip to either Idaho or Montana. What were some of your more memorable experiences visiting those two states? Yeah, I've already hit on Montana. And I tell you, Idaho, I would say this isn't a dig at Idaho. I love Idaho. It's kind of the Northwest Alabama. I think it gets a horrible reputation and, you know, or everyone just overlooks it. And it is absolutely every bit as pretty as that Northwest Montana. I love it. I, I spent some time around Sandpoint. I went up to right at the border, Mineral Ridge area, I Sawtooth Mountains. I briefly got to go there. Absolutely gorgeous. I just love it so much. Idaho is a very underrated place. It is absolutely beautiful. I spent a lot of time there. Stevens Lake and Loon Lake are nice little hikes, just like quick 45 minutes or breathtaking. Yeah, I've I've got a chance to visit Sandpoint and go up to Schweitzer. And that cool. panhandle area is just gorgeous and so diverse in, in landscape. And then the further south you get, you get the more desert, but then like the peaks are just a little bit more rugged. You really get a lot of the trails to yourself, I feel like, in, in Idaho. Um, you don't see Absolutely. too many people on. Now, Monty, you know, we, we've touched base on this, but Montana definitely holds a special place in your heart. When you do go yep. back, what are some of the places that you like to visit or, or frequently visit when you when you make it back out there? Yeah, that's why I'm trying to move back out there long term eventually. I'm working on that. <laughs> but I've got support from, you know, his fiance and family. But I, I love it. And, you know, 
obviously Glacier National Park is the big one. It's hard to beat that. Grinnell Glacier is one of my favorite there. It's on the cutting side. It's, it's a wonderful hike. You know, you got grizzly bears and, and mountain lions and all that stuff. I kind of want to hit on the kind of more secluded, smaller things people don't think of about Montana, specifically that Northwest spot. As soon as you go in from the highway, you know, you hit Troy and then Libby. Those are beautiful little, little small towns. I, I absolutely love those places. I make sure to go there. Every single time I go, I go to the same gas station. I just love it, man. <laughs> There's a swinging bridge there that is super fun. It's pretty well known. You, that's not very secluded, but it's right off the highway. It looks like you would have hiked 10 miles to get to there. It's such a pretty spot. <laughs> but that whole drive is breathtaking. There's a cabin at Mountain Range around Libby, a place called Lee Lake. It's one of the first big hikes I did. That's my daughter's middle name is Lee. That was probably the most memorable hike I've ever had. That was a place I'd done some research in, in, in college and things. Someone was studying bears, and, and someone had actually almost got killed up there before by a grizzly bear attack. Mm. So I say that to say I was a little <laughs> nervous about it. And that's obviously something you never want to take lightly. Always, you know, bear spray, be smart, you know, mm. be cautious. You know, you, you got to be smart about this. I'm kind of a, none of a grilling junkie, but I do like adventure and a little bit of risk. So that kind of made it even more fun to me, even though realistically, you know, you're not, that's not going to happen. You got like a yeah. very, very minor chance of that. Yeah. I just say that to kind of set the day up. So I was kind of nervous about it, but got there super early. High there's a very steep climb. It's pretty intense, a couple miles, but uh, you cross a beautiful waterfall. And then when you get to the top, you start hearing the water trickle into the big glacier lake. And it's just stunning. It, it's nobody was there. I was the only person. So that's that's a very spiritual place, if you will, for, for me. It's 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 where I don't know what you want to call it, man. It's just, you know, I see it all the time in my head and, and just the memories. And it's just a wonderful place. It's very secluded. And then Granite Lake's another one that's wonderful there. That was a little more intense. I kind of got lost. Mm -hmm. People are picking up on things. I was used to kind of the smaller hikes in the south. Going out there, it's a little bit different. So I had some I had some rookie mistakes I was going through, you know. But hey, I wouldn't change. Experience and failure is the best teacher, right? Exactly. <laughs> so that one started the trail about noon. And we're talking about a oof, 12, 13 mile hike. The sun was setting around five at that time, five or mm -hmm. six. So I had some fun on that day. I made it. It was beautiful. But I had to go pretty quick. But Granite Lake is beautiful. I crossed three rivers that day. Probably the coldest I've been. That or when I climbed up the side of, of a mountain. I think this was Idaho. My, my gloves were torn. So my hands, I could barely feel those afterwards. But I loved every moment of those, those hikes as well. But yes, yeah, that Northwest Montana. I love that little spot. And, and Libby and Troy, I want to give them shout outs to little towns that people should go through. Beautiful. And all of Montana's like that. Missoula. I mean, all, all these, it's all beautiful. And I know there's there's a lot of growth going on there. You know, not necessarily smiled about by the locals. I kind of took on that persona there for a little bit. But hey, you know, I think if anybody can improve their life and make it better, that's a great state to do. And the people there, for the most part, are pretty nice. Everyone's laid back. I'm not much of a hunter, but if you are, it's a great state to be. I just kind of enjoy being amongst wildlife and just exploring you know and, and it's it's got everything for anybody you, know, you got ranchers and it's real cowboys live there i know texas brags about it but texas texas doesn't have anything on montana montana wyoming that's that's cowboys right there you know i think people hear the nickname big sky country and for me when when i first visited montana like being there and seeing just the vastness of it like, I understood why they call it Big Sky Country. And just like you said, it, it's so diverse, but each region has its own unique outdoor opportunities and landscape. It's really a place that, you know, I think the more things you cross off, the more things you're adding on. Now, I feel like over the last, especially the last two years, cold water submersion has been something that has been blowing up all over social media. And, you know, one of our regular segments here on the podcast is doing a deep dive in our guests' Instagram feed and asking them about a particular picture that caught our attention. And it seems like you, especially, Monty, when you were here in, in Washington and exploring Idaho and Montana, you were doing the natural cold water submersion in some of these alpine lakes or rivers. Yeah. How did that kind of come about? And um, do you remember yeah. which one was the coldest one you, you jumped into? Yeah, absolutely. That's kind of funny. Yeah. You know, so, hey, you know, everyone always says, you know, cool before it was cool. You know, I think I actually did that this time. No pun intended, by the way, on that. <laughs> I just love it, man. I, I, I think I think the first one I did was in Washington. I cannot remember the lake. It may have been a river, actually. I love I'm a little weird, man. 
I don't, I wouldn't say I'm a hippie. I just like being one with like my surroundings and really just kind of being mellow. And you really find that inner peace. So I was like, hey, why not get in the river and pull the stream, man? Like, you know, just kind of, because, you know, I've fly fished before and that's really peaceful. And so kind of that concept, and I got in there and just did that. And I was like, you know, I wonder, you know, if I could swim somewhere eventually one day if it's hot or something. And sure enough, I, I went to Idaho, I think a couple weeks later. And now this was still early spring. So that water was frigid. I think I jumped in Stevens Lake, I believe is what it was. It was a very small, it's not even like right barely in Idaho and right at the Idaho Montana border. And for whatever reason that day, I think that was the Instagram picture. I, I got in, I was cold. <laughs> I stuck it out though. I think it was only like 50 degrees outside or something that day, maybe lower, but Ooh. I got in there and I loved it. And I just was like, Hey, this is tough. It's a challenge. But as, as everyone knows now, the health benefits of doing that are outstanding. It's like your body goes into survival mode and it just forgets all the issues it's had, you know? And I kind of did that instinctually. I don't know. I can't really explain it. I just I tried it and I enjoyed it and I just kind of kept doing it. At each lake I did it at Goat Lake up there in Washington. I did it at Lee Lake, obviously, Granite Lake. And it was awesome. I, I loved it. And it really is. I've, I've actually got a history in, in exercise science and things like that. I'm not super advanced on it, but I've done some studies and it's really beneficial for recovery and rejuvenation, if you will. And it's great for hormone levels. And it's just fun. That's really kind of why I like it. It's instinctual in a way. Yeah, that, that picture, I would have thought it was in, in winter because there's still quite a bit of snow and even <laughs> like ice fields. If you had to estimate the temperature of the water, do you think it was in the 30s or were you maybe hovering around 40? Yeah, I'd say mid mid 30s. You know, my body was telling me this is 10 degrees, but you know, scientifically, <laughs> yeah, pr probably probably 35 to 40 degrees. It's frigid, man. It, I last, I hey, well, after a while you stop feeling it, right? And then you're like, all right, this didn't get, I got to get out. <laughs> that feeling yeah. when you get out though, and the sun was out, I just laid down, man. And it was just like a freaking amazing experience. Like, you know, just, it's just a great day. No, that's a true, true statement, man. Like if you have a sunny day, even if it's not necessarily warm coming out of uh, mm -hmm. cold water, whether it's an alpine lake or river and just basking in the sun, it feels a whole lot different. It feels like you're almost at a beach somewhere. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, Monty, you've also spent some time in the great state of Colorado, which is, you know, I think for the outdoor community, it, it's one of the, the places to, to go and experience. How was it switching gears from Washington to Colorado? And did the altitude impact you in any way? Yeah, it really did. And you wouldn't think it would just because of the hiking. And I was in pretty good shape, you know. I try to stay pretty decent shape, you know, year round. And it kicked my butt. You know? um, it's, uh, it's funny. It's a mile high city. I actually lived around Denver. I went, first off, Colorado, yeah, amazing state. And the people there, Colorado, if I could describe it, it's like a, it's a very progressive state. But it's got some kind of Midwest feel to it. It's a very unique place, but it's yeah. it's awesome. I mean, it's it's a great place. Tons of opportunity. You you could spend two years straight going to a new place every day, hiking and you know, whatever you want to do. They got sand dunes. They got they got everything except the ocean, I guess. But yeah, you know, <laughs> when you got the mountains, who needs an ocean? Yeah. My opinion. But yeah, Colorado is a great place. But yeah, the elevation. I, I did a hike in Estes. Or Estes Park, sorry. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. But it got me. I, it was only like a six-mile hike. It's kind of, I do the All Trails app, and I guess free plug there, even though I feel like everybody uses it. said it was a uh, moderate hike, and I got about two miles in, and I was like, I am out. I was like, I am gassed. And I was like, what in the world is going on? My, and my buddy, Taylor, he told me, he's like, man, this elevation's intense up here. I was like, dude, you're telling me? I was like, I thought I was in good enough shape to handle this. I made it. I just had to take my time and eventually got there. It was a humbling experience. You know, it's life has a funny way, especially the outdoors have a great way of, of humbling you. And that was one of those experiences. So uh, I would recommend in fairness, I'd only been in town for like two, three days when I did that. So my body had not had time to acclimate. So that's a, that's a bad mistake. Now, Monty, we've, we've kind of touched base on it. You know, physical health and fitness seem to be a key uh, component in your life. And for a lot of hikers, getting outside and enjoying the outdoors as part of their regular fitness routine. What's been your relationship with fitness and the outdoors? And, you know, as we get ready for the spring months, is there any workouts that you recommend for hikers to get ready for the spring hiking season? Sure. Staying in good shape is important for many things. It's it's improves your mental health too. I did a lot of exercise science studies. I experimented with a little bit of kind of physique competitions there in my early twenties, 
wasn't really my personality. I'm kind of more reserved, so I didn't really want to do all that. But I understood the science behind it and the importance of it. And I've really, I've stayed in fitness pretty much for, I'd say, close to 15 years now. As far as hiking goes, I, I would say core, legs, conditioning. Staying, you got to get that upper body strong too to help you when you need it. Stair masters, anything with a little bit of elevation. Treadmill is a very good start. As we all know, when you're hiking, you're going to have different, you know, elevations, increases, yeah. inclines, and things of that nature. I would just start at pace, maybe wear a vest as you're doing some conditioning. If you're going to some altitude, I know some guys that wear a mask that kind of de- decreases the amount of oxygen available to you. That's pretty intense. I don't think you have to do that. But yeah. if you're like really trying to crush it or for some reason, you could do that. But yeah, I, you know, some stairs, obviously just a good old walk. You know, here in the South, I will say this, it's the humidity is pretty rough. I, I, I do not like that. I'd rather be in about 20 degrees in a blizzard with 20 mile an hour winds than 80 degrees here with humidity. I, it's just town wired. It's what it is. Maybe it's because I've been here for a while. I'm tired of it. But so that if I can breathe in that, I can breathe anywhere is my, my motto. But in all seriousness, though, that, I would say start small, gradually work your way up. And don't be scared to challenge yourself because it really is important. I've taken, I'm not going to say who, but I've taken people close to me on hikes before and they haven't been in the best shape and they really struggle. And it kind of took away from the experience. And it's like, man, I really wish they could have enjoyed this like, like I did. Just just getting to that baseline is important just for the quality of your enjoyment of outdoors, you know? I think those are, are all solid tips. And I, I've shared this in the past, but my first hike ever in high school, my buddies took me on the 2,000 foot elevation gain within, you know, a mile and a half. And it was just brutal. And I thought like, if this was hiking, like, I don't want any, any part of it. It wasn't until like I started off on easier inclines and then worked my way up back up to those type of elevation gains. But, you know, for, for folks that haven't had a chance to experience humidity in the South, you know, I I visited Atlanta a few times and it literally feels like you hit a physical wall when you step outside of air conditioned building. It just hits you. Oh, it's rough. I try to tell people here that I've never left. I'm like, you guys don't understand. Like, <laughs> you can't have a life from June to September. You know, you don't have to stay inside in other places. It's, it's rough, man. You know, and it's, I dealt with allergies growing up. I don't know if I had allergy induced asthma. I don't think so, but maybe a little bit of it. I was healthy as could be out in Washington. I think I sneezed one time in two and a half years or two and a half, three years. I mean, it was, it was awesome, man. And I, I don't, I'm not saying it was the humidity. I just think I could I could breathe better, I felt better. And it, it's rough, man. Yeah, the humidity. And I don't care what anybody says, you never get used to it. That's good to know because I, <laughs> yeah. I do wonder if you just get acclimated to it. <laughs> I get. I guess you do a little bit. I've got some family. A lot of my family actually lives in East Tennessee, uh, kind of close to North Carolina area. And it's not near as humid up there as it is where I live. And uh, yeah, they, they can't handle it down here. Monty, you know, I feel like a lot of day hikers have a regular summit routine or maybe an end of the hike routine. For some, it's a favorite snack. For others, it's some sort of drink or even just a moment of zen. Do you have a regular custom that you do when you reach your destination or maybe when you make it back out? Yeah, I mean, well, I know we're joking about the jumps. But typically, the first thing I would do, take my shirt off and jump in and cool off if it's kind of summer. Kind of like a celebration dip, if you will. Yeah. But most of the time, winter or snow, just take it in. You know, see it, maybe take a second to reflect and just be still. That's one of the favorite things. Just enjoy the moment, you know, because I think in today's society, Snapchat, Instagram, TikTok, all this stuff, those are those are okay tools to have. And they're wonderful. You know, they help spread information and opportunity to others. But personally, you also need to set aside time without those things to put it up and just be in the moment and just really enjoy it for for a little while. And that's I kind of enjoy doing that. And then probably a banana or a protein bar or something, something I'm carrying. When it, when it comes to your pack list, Monty, is there a luxury item that you tend to pack regularly that maybe falls outside of the essential list, but that you like to pack just to have? Interesting. I've had little pocket knives and stuff before. I will say during my time, Montana and Idaho hiking days, I noticed some of the trails were pretty brushed. Some of them, keep in mind, I'm doing the kind of backwood trails. I actually did a thing. My friend called me Machete Monty. Shout out Ryan. I, I <laughs> took a machete with me and was cutting a trail as I was going to numerous trails. Nothing out of regulation, just right there, just where we had a clear trail. So 
kind of voluntarily worked, I guess, for the you know wildlife department. So I'd say a machete <laughs> there for a little bit. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> and I feel like especially in the southeast, things grow so fast. Oh, it's hard yeah. to maintain the trail and. Sometimes you just need a machete to, to kind of clear yeah, out the, the overgrowth. It solves a lot of problems. You know, when this episode comes out, it's going to be the start of 2024. Do you have any hiking or travel goals for the new year? Yeah, I've got several. Every, every year I try to take a trip. Now that I'm back here, I've stuck to it too. If not one, maybe two trips a year out west, specifically mostly the Northwest. I've gone to Colorado a few times. I love Utah too, by the way. Salt Lake City is awesome. I went there with my dad. Great place. I enjoyed going there too. But I, I try to go to Montana, obviously, sentimental reasons, obviously, Washington and Idaho, too. Bucket list. I want to check out Vancouver. I want to do Oregon. I did Mount Hood briefly, but I was with some friends, and I really feel like I never really got to experience Oregon. So I think Oregon's next on my uh, to-do list. That and I spent some time in California, but not the place I wanted to. Northern California is, I want to go to the Redwoods. That's definitely on my bucket list. Yeah, solid, solid bucket list items, Monty. That was it for the regular questions. This last little bit of the podcast is the this or that questions. There are some some new ones for the season. I'm just going to give you two outdoor topics and you just choose which one you personally gravitate towards. So the first one is, do you prefer a steep incline or a steep decline? Ooh, steep incline. And then when it comes to waterfalls or summits, which one do you prefer? Oh, that's tough summits but the waterfalls have, have crept up because they've been so pretty ones but mountains are where my heart is so I, I go some and then when it comes to the trail systems do you prefer switchbacks or going straight up i think switchbacks you know hey why do you want to cut a hike short enjoy it now do you rock trek poles or do you hike freehand mostly freehand i've done i've done those before only in really intense situations I don't know, man. I, maybe I was just young and dumb, but I just kind of like the challenge of it. Recall my story about my hands, fingers going yeah. numb. Uh, yeah, that's could have used those that day in the polls. <laughs> now, when it comes to your footwear, do you prefer trail runners or hiking boots? Hiking boots. And I think I know the answer to this one, but when it comes to bodies of water on the trail, do you touch the water or do you stay dry? I'll get all the way in, man. I, yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah it's, it doesn't count unless you jump in, right? Um, this one's a tough one. Sunset hikes or sunrise hikes? Oh, that's brutal, man. I'm going to say sunrise only because you typically beat a crowd when you do that. Typically, you got a better chance. You have a better chance of missing the huge crowd than sunset. Sunset, you get all the lazy people that slip in from there. You know, no offense to those people. <laughs> <laughs> now, this one's another tough one, but spring flowers or fall colors? Hmm. That is tough. In the South, all colors. Out there in the West, spring flower. Okay. I like that answer. Yeah. And then the last one is outside of the national park. Do you prefer national forest or state park? I'm going to go forest just because it's maybe a little less organized. I kind of like that chance to adventure. Well, that was it for the this or that questions, Monty. Really appreciate you coming on the podcast. For folks that want to follow your adventures and see some of your previous hikes in Montana and Washington and some of those gorgeous waterfalls in Tennessee, what's the best places online that they can follow you at? Yeah, I pretty much go to Instagram. I haven't really got a TikTok yet. I don't really dabble with that, but but Instagram underscore JR5, I think is my handle. And that's pretty much where I post it. I do a lot of stories. I'll post a little bit. I'm going to try to get better at it. But yeah, I've got a lot of pictures I hadn't posted yet either, so I may trickle those in too. But yeah, I'd say Instagram. I've got Twitter as well, same handle. And then obviously Facebook. I don't know if many people use Facebook still, but uh, yeah. And we'll be sure to, to link all those, Monty, so people can check you out. Again, it's been a blast talking to you. And I really enjoyed hearing about your experiences here in Eastern Washington and, and just the Pacific Northwest and, and Tennessee as well. But appreciate you coming on the podcast. Thank you so much. Absolutely, man. Like I said, I, I, could, I love it. I, I can't think of a time I've gotten to this, you know, talk to someone strictly about hiking for for a long time. I, I love it, man. I really appreciate the opportunity and hopefully maybe I can inspire a couple of people to explore. Jump into the lake, like you said. Yes, jump in. When in doubt, jump in. It'll solve everything. Or there if you, you have go. any issues, you won't be thinking about them at that moment. And that brings us to the end of this episode alongside Monty. We extend a heartfelt thanks to him for coming on the podcast. Make sure to stay connected and follow his upcoming adventures on Instagram at Monty underscore junior five. And don't forget to check out the episode show notes for more. We have an incredible lineup of episodes planned throughout the winter months, and we can't wait to share them with you. New episodes will be dropping every Monday with occasional bonus episodes on Fridays. To ensure you never miss out on those thrilling tales, remember to hit that like and subscribe button. Your support means the world to us. Don't forget to join our vibrant community on Instagram at Hikes and Mikes. 
We'll be sharing episode visuals, my own personal hiking content, and so much more. Let's stay connected and continue to inspire each other on this remarkable journey. As we bid farewell, remember to tread those happy trails, embrace the great outdoors, and keep the spirit of adventure alive. Until next time, my fellow explorers, happy hiking. This episode's music was created by Ketza. Follow him on Instagram, at Ketza Music. This episode is brought to you by Flip Socks. Whether you're on the trail, on the job, or in the yard, Flip Socks will keep Mother Nature out of your boots with their innovative nylon sleeve. You no longer need to worry about any annoying debris getting trapped in your boots during your hikes. Simply flip down the nylon sleeve over any boot to prevent Mother Nature from finding its way inside, keeping your feet comfortable all day long. To get your first pair, visit FlipSocksWithAZ.com and enter promo code HIKESMIKES10 at checkout to receive 10% off your order. And for listeners who use the promo code at checkout, I'll be donating 100% of the Season 2 promo code proceeds to Big City Mountaineers, who provide transformative experiences through connections to nature that strengthen life skills and build community for youth and disinvested communities across the nation. So if you're tired of bits and pieces of the trail finding its way into your hiking boots, pick up a pair of flip socks today with the promo code HIKESMIKES10 to get 10% off. For website and promo code, see the episode description.